shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Hi folks, I'm Dave Grant, host of Let the Bible Speak. I hope you'll get your Bible out so you can follow along with me. We're going to continue our study where we use an example of three chairs representing three generations. So last week we looked at uh, first generation um, faithfulness and a heart for God. The children usually follow in the footsteps of their parents. But by the third generation, they can absolutely lose their faith. Now, we won't review all of the scriptures we looked at, but if you're interested in a copy of my notes, I'd be happy to send them to you or email them to you. Today, we're going to kind of fast forward into the New Testament, talk about our faith. And one of the things I want to look at is first chair represents someone who makes a commitment to the Lord and is faithful in their living and their talking and the way they do business. So a commitment to have a heart for God puts us in the first chair. Now that can happen at any point. The children of that faithful servant are either going to adopt their parents' faith and stay faithful all the time their parents are alive, but in that case, the third generation, their children won't know the Lord because they only follow a faith that was shown to them. What's necessary is to make it a faith of your own. Whenever someone makes faith in Jesus and uh, has a heart for God, whenever that takes place, they become first chair. And then we have to develop and groom and teach and nurture our children so that they develop a faith of their own. Not just go to church because dad went to church. So we have to each take a position in first chair at some point in our lives to have faithful children afterwards. Now, I'll give you some examples from the New Testament. So the first thing we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I ended the show last week reading that, but I really think we have to read it again and then look at it more closely as to what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us about our faith. Now, 1 Corinthians is, you know, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and Romans. Okay, that's New Testament, the back of your Bible. In 1 Corinthians, which are the next two letters, these are letters written by the Apostle Paul to the church that was meeting in Corinth, a city in, uh, in the first century. Corinth was a major metropolitan area where people were coming in from all over the world to trade and to do business. But the church was established there, and when people became Christians and adopted that faith and made it their own, then they went out to their own homes and the church spread. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, going to look at the first three verses. Now, if you have subtitles in your Bible, and if you got one from uh, Let the Bible Speak, then you do have those. And it says divisions in the church. Well, he started that in chapter one, and how early in the history of the church, people were already starting to adopt their own ideas. And I follow Paul, and I, I'm going to follow Peter, and I'm going to follow this one. And another one will say, I follow Christ. And Paul is trying to help them understand divisions in the church are wrong. We 
have to be unified in the church. So that's what this essay is about. But in chapter 3, he says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Verse 4 says, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Now, let me point out that this gives us both aspects. Now, if first chair is faithful and third chair, they don't even know the Lord, you have to review what we talked about with Joshua and David. Grandpa was faithful, Grandpa Joshua. But by the time his grandchildren grew up, they didn't even know the Lord. Now, that's sad. So at some point, we've got to learn the secret of how do we teach our children so they can develop a faith of their own and become first chair, become the grandpa that will lead another generation and another generation to the Lord. This is important. I've had a lot of people over the years who have said, oh, I just wish I had started sooner because my children are not faithful. Well, th this is a, let's call it a double-edged sword or a, a two-sided knife, like a dagger. There is two ways to look at this. One is we have to do our part that our children will learn to develop their faith, but they have to make their own decisions. I mean, God has given humankind decision-making since the very beginning. Adam and Eve were given a choice. They chose and they sinned. So no matter how you do it, sometimes you just scratch your head saying, "How? why don't they want to be a part of the Christian community? And they have to make that decision for themselves. When they make a decision to follow Christ, they move into first chair because it's their faith. We can't Perfect. Perfection. Now, as a general rule, if you do what God has asked you to do, your children will see an example of faith and follow it. So let me break this down in, in 1 Corinthians. If you're looking at your Bible, he addresses them as brothers. In other words, these people are following Christ. They are Christians. Although at this point, they, they're not calling them Christians. Yet. It was in Antioch where they first started being called Christians. But he says to them, brothers in Christ, I couldn't address you as spiritual people. Now that would be people who have their own faith. That would be people who are going to make a commitment like Joshua did. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the spiritual faithful in Christ. And he addresses them as brothers in Christ. But he says, I have to feed you milk, not solid food. Well, what does that sound like? Sounds like an infant, okay? Infants have a period of time where they don't eat regular food. They have to drink milk. And he says, my teachings to you have been milk. I can't go on to maturity and teach you other things because you're not ready. Now, that tells me that although we make a commitment to Christ, if we continue to live in the flesh or in the world and, and still follow our earthly desires, then we are merely infants. We need to grow. We need to develop our faith. Now, many times you've heard me say, faith is... Um, Obedience with legs on it. In other words, faith isn't just believing in Jesus. No, believing in Jesus prompts us to do what he asked us to do. So faith is belief in action. Faith is belief tied to obedience. So if we want someone to develop a faith, it will affect the way they live. It will affect the way they talk, the 
where they work, what they do, how they treat each other. And he's seeing from example that these Corinthians in the church are merely infants and they need to grow. So he gives them things that they, it's in a way, he's reprimanding them, is he not? He's saying, you're not growing. You need to start applying what you learn, living it out in your life, and that develops our faith. Uh, I have a lesson planned for next week that actually is going to take us into practical examples of how we can grow our faith. And then we apply those in teaching our children and our grandchildren, and they will develop their faith. Everyone has to have faith of their own. I can't rely on my dad's faith to get me to heaven. You can't rely on grandma's faith to get you to heaven. You have to develop your own. So first chair would be the spiritual, not those of the flesh. Although both have been baptized into Christ and are part of the church, some are developing their faith and others are not. Now, second chair or second generation would be um, the children of the spiritual and the worldly. Okay, let's just look at it, spiritual and worldly. They're in the church together. And the children of the spiritual will be taught how to build their faith. and They'll have to make a decision for themselves, but they will have a good foundation of how to build that faith. The worldly haven't been able to develop their own faith as it is. So they're not going to be able to develop that faith in their children. So even though they made a commitment to Christ, what's going to happen to their children? They're not going to learn how to develop a faith and they're going to fall away. They may go to church their whole life or at least as long as mom and dad are alive. But if they don't develop their own faith, their children will not even know who the Lord is. When I say no, well, we know that there was Jesus Christ. And we could say, I believe in Jesus Christ. But if you don't develop the faith, and again, faith is, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I am going to do what he's asked me to do. That builds faith. So we don't want third chair Christians in the church. We want them all to grow, develop their faith. So everyone is a first chair Christian, a first generation. I've made a commitment to the Lord. Now it would be nice if first, second, and third chair were all faithful, but it requires developing that next generation. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. So we're going to go over several chapters here. But we're still in 1 Corinthians. We're not going to go over into 2 yet. There are two different letters that were written at different times to the same group of people. In chapter 15, I want to look at verse 42. Now, again, we're going to make application as to uh, spiritual and worldly. And we're going to use a different word in this context, natural. Let's read it. So what is it with the resurrection of the dead? What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. I'll stop there for just a moment. We'll read some more. What he's talking about sowing is your life and what you've done with it. Okay? It's perishable. This, this life and the clothes that I'm wearing, everything will end up dying. They will be buried or sown. But what is raised of those who are faithful is imperishable. So this life as I know it is going to perish. But my spirit, my soul will be imperishable. So that when I'm raised from the dead and I am going to get the opportunity to live with God forever, I will be given an existence, an imperishable existence. Revelation is a new body, a new heaven, and a new earth. Well, I'm looking forward to that. 
that is imperishable. In other words, it won't die. It won't fade away. It's going to last for eternity. Let's keep reading. Um, it is sown in dishonor. There we go. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. Natural being physical. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now he's talking about Adam being created in the garden. The last Adam is Jesus Christ. And he is for us a life-giving spirit. He is spiritual. Adam was mortal. He, he failed to obey. So his belief did not develop into faith. Now, we can also develop that at a later date. We don't know what happened to Adam. We don't know if he repented and turned to God, but we do know that his son, Seth, became a uh, an ancestor of those who call upon the Lord. So where did he learn that? He might have learned it from God alone, but it's possible that Adam and Eve realized they had sinned and began to develop their own faith begin to be obedient. So that's all speculation. We don't know because the rest of the story is not there. God didn't give us everything. But we do know that faith existed in the next generation. And it can for us too. I'm going to take a short break. Well, you can write these things down, but we have several things that we can offer on this program. Bible course uh, is a a basic course that gives you an idea of how the Bible works and how you can read it. Um, I send out lesson one. If you complete it and send it back to me, we send the next booklet in the order. If you need a Bible to study with, we have a hardcover uh, English standard version, and that's the version that I read on the program, so it's easier to follow along. If any of these things would be of interest to you, you can write to me at the Church of Christ in Escanaba, P.O. Box 751, and the zip in Escanaba is 49829. Or um, throughout the program, you'll see my phone number, my email address. You can write to me in any way, and we'll get that Bible or that Bible course to you. Let's kind of recap where we've gone so far. First chair, second chair, third chair are three generations. Okay, so now that we've looked at some in Corinthians that show that there is a difference between physical, natural, worldly, and spiritual. And that difference is faith. Actually obeying the one you believe in. So, of the three generations, which chair do you sit in? Did you have a faithful grandfather or grandmother who obeyed the Lord, did what he asked, and was faithful in all that they did. And yet, you're not being faithful, then you'd be third chair, right? Or maybe your mom and dad have been faithful Christians, and they've taught you how to be a faithful Christian. But the only reason you go to church is because you feel guilty not going because your parents want you to go. And so as you grow older, when you come home on vacation to visit mom and dad, well, maybe you'll go to church with them. But you haven't developed a faith of your own, and you do your own thing when you are on your own. That's second chair. You're faithful to your parents, not to the Lord. Faithful means the Lord, you believe in him, and you want to do everything he asks. In other words, he becomes your master. You take your orders from him. Um, so first chair, second chair, third chair, which chair are you in? I think each one of us can identify that. We have to decide, okay, when Jesus tells us to love our neighbor as ourself, well, no one does harm to themselves, right? 
nobody wants to, and there could be someone who's got very bad emotional problems or chemical imbalances, and, and they do seek to harm themselves. They are the exception. God designed us with a protective, you know, like somebody comes at me and I'm going to, I'm going to put my arms up to protect myself. Well, that's important to, to understand that we don't want to harm ourselves and we don't want anybody else to harm us. So when we look at this particular aspect, we want to do what God wants us to do because he's the one in charge. He's the one who made the, the plan. So if I obey what my Lord has asked me to do, I develop a faith. I become first chair. And that's so important because what hope is there for my grandchildren if I myself don't become first chair? So you don't want to be in second chair. Here's the children of, uh, no, the children of first chair people become automatically second chair until they develop their own faith. So we have a great responsibility in first chair to teach them. But the children of the second chair Christian, second chair Christians are those who never develop a faith of their own. Paul was referring to them in 1 Corinthians 3. Now, they're in very grave danger. The children of second chair Christians don't get to see it in action. Don't get to see an example of faithfulness in their family. And they grow up not knowing the Lord. Now, I'll give you an example from real life. There are millions of people today who don't know the Lord, have never been before, have never sang songs of worship to the Lord because they grew up in a family where no one had faith. So they have to become first chair on their own. That's why we reach out with the TV ministry. That's why we reach out in our neighborhoods. That's why we talk to our family and friends about Jesus in hopes that they will see the beauty of his offer of forgiveness and become first chair Christians. I want to use one more example. It's in the book of Revelation. Now everybody, oh, Revelation's hard to understand. No, it's, it's not really. There's a lot of symbols that I don't fully understand. But that doesn't mean I should be afraid of it. Revelation was a, a revealing from Jesus to John so he could warn the churches or give them an attaboy. There were seven churches in Asia, so this letter was written to them. And each one had a different level of faith. And Jesus pointed to it and said, you need to repent or you are doing a great job. So you read those seven letters to each of the churches and they're short little letters. Then, well, the book of Revelation is a letter and letter is addressed to those seven churches. But each one has a commendation or a uh, need to repent from, from Jesus. And so let's look at Revelation chapter 3. And that's the last book in your Bible. Now, if you'll notice, Revelation chapter 2, just go back with your finger for a minute. Ah, boy, these little tiny pages are hard to get with my old thumb. Chapter 2, he begins with the church in Ephesus. And then we have Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira. You see the little uh, headings. We're going right to chapter 3 to give you an example of first chair Christians. The ones who have a faith and are committed to the cause. And that's in verse 14 and 15. This is an example of both. So first and second chair. Let me read 14 and 15. Jesus is telling John, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, that's a city, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. He's talking about himself. Jesus Christ is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of God's creation. 15 says, I know your works. 
the Christians in Laodicea. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus isn't happy with the Christians in Laodicea, is he? It's quite obvious. But the two descriptions that he gives is what he would prefer from them. They are second chair, either lukewarm or however you want to state it. They haven't really practiced what they believe. But the hot Christians would be, I'm on fire for the Lord. So I put in my notes, first chair are those who are hot, who are ready to go. They are sold out to Christ. The cold Christians or the lukewarm Christians aren't sold out. They're not practicing what they believe. You can read the rest of that and see that. And so then when you drop down to verse 16, verse 16, he says, because you are lukewarm, this is the Christians. Neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You don't want Jesus disfellowshipping you because you aren't willing to take a stand. You're not willing to be sold out, committed to Christ. He requires that. Well, I really don't want to upset anybody, so I'm, I'm just going to, oh, I'm going to believe quietly. And then my family won't get upset with me. No, Jesus isn't happy with that. He wants you to be committed totally to his work. Now, also in 14 and 15 that we just read is the cold Christian. That would be like third chair Christians who never develop a faith of their own and begin to slip away. We don't want to be there either. So when you read in the Bible what Jesus has asked us to um, I'm thinking of love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's not easy. But if we're on fire for the Lord, we're actually going to start practicing. We're going to look for ways to bless the life of those who hate us. That is tough. But by doing that, what happens to our faith? grows exponentially when we begin to practice the lifestyle of Jesus. When we adopt the righteousness of Jesus, then we become the faithful. I've run out of time. So I hope that you will read a little bit more about these seven letters to the church. It's exciting stuff but then begin to practice what Jesus has asked you to do. Thanks for being with me today. God bless.